listening to Truth To You. That's truth number two, letter U.org. I'm John Owen. Good day to Joseph, who commented saying, awesome teachings. This is one of my favorite programs. Thank you, Joseph. And wherever you may be around the world, thank you for joining us. It is time for Pearls from the Torah Portion with Keith Johnson and Nehemiah hey, Gordon. Hey. G'day, fellas. G'day, g'day. <laughs> Here we are again, and today... Good night, Jono. Uh, I want to do a shout-out to uh, David of Wake Up Ministries, who listens every week with his family over in Norway. And uh, keep listening, David. Norway. Today we are in... <laughs> Kara. It's uh, Numbers 16, verse 1, to 18, verse 32. And it begins like this. You ready? Yes. Now, Kara, the son of Izar, the son of Kara, the son of Levi, and Atan, uh, with Zatan, and Abiram, the son of Eliab, and On, the son of Peled, son of Reuven, took men, and they rose up before Moses. Now, this is just unbelievable, Keith. They took men, they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of their congregation, men of renown, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them. And Yehovah is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yehovah? Mm-hmm. Oh my word! So, so, so we could do some psychology here. I mean, like seriously, this is like a classic uh, situation where we could really go in and deal with the psychological aspects of what's going on. You know, groupthink. There's all sorts of things that we could do. But one of the things I think is interesting, and I know that your your um, your uh, translation says these are uh, men, men, men of renown. Is mm. that correct? That's what I've got. So we could do a whole uh, issue here on uh, you know the psychology of what's happening or groupthink, but I wanted to stop for a second and just talk about this idea of leaders who had been appointed. And yours said, "Men of renown." Is that mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That is correct. Okay. And 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 in your in your in verse uh, two there, is that what you're is that I mean, what you're that's, reading? That's the end of verse two. It says that they okay. uh, the representatives of the congregation, men of renown. Okay. And then mine says these are community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. Hmm. So I think that's a pretty important difference. Uh, and so, of course, if Nehemia is uh, is with us right now, we, we need to ask him this simple question. Uh, yeah. What does it say in the Hebrew? So he's got so men of says, renown. Mine says community leaders. What does yours say? Okay. Well, it's actually, well, it's got three things. Um, mm-hmm. It's got Nisi Eida, which you could mm-hmm. literally translate as princes of, of the congregation. Mm-hmm. Nisi Eimo Eid, which uh, literally would be translated, uh, those who are called to the gathering. And then on Sheshem, men of name. Aha. Men of shame. Yes. So, so there are three, 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 three types of people or people who perhaps fit all three of these categories. Um, okay. Princes of the congregation, men who are called to the gathering and men, and men of renown. Or those who are called to the gathering and men of renown. Men of okay. men of name, literally men of shame. Okay, and so one of the things that I wanted to bring up, just as something to discuss, and, and you know, this this just happened to catch my attention, is when it says and it says uh, it says these men, these men, uh, you know, the three men that it names in the beginning, and it says and certain Reubenites, then it gives the two names of them. So uh, so the question becomes this: so of the tribes that are represented right now, is it mm-hmm. fair to say we're dealing with Levi and Reuben? It seems to be. Um, they're definitely the ringleaders. They're mm-hmm. not the only they're ones. The you know, they're it, not it, the only ones. Yeah. No, I mean, they're obviously not the only ones because there's 250 people from, you know, just from the children of Israel. I mean, the ringleaders are clearly uh, Levi, the Levites. And then on top of that, you got some Reubenites who are, who are um, you know, taking major active roles. Mm-hmm. Although they kind of have a different issue than the, than the, um, than the Levites. Mm-hmm. The Levites are like, well, why aren't we allowed to be priests? You know, we're, we were chosen by God. We should be priests. He's, he's, God is prophesying to 72 of us. Why are you so special? You know, mm-hmm. um, we had that scene in a previous Torah portion. Yep. He's among us. We're, we're all seeing the uh, the the cloud and the and the glory yes. of Yehovah. You know who who made you? You know who made you a uh, prince over us? Why mm. why are you so special? And and uh, but then the Datan Aviram, they you know the, from Reuben, their issue is well, wait a minute, we didn't get into the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, and now you're telling us we're never going to get there, that we're going to die here in the desert. We got <laughs> we got we we need some change of leadership. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, you know, you could actually go through this. I mean, a psychologist could really have a field day with this as far as what's going on. Mm-hmm. But what, what, the, reason that I, the reason that I'm just bringing it up is that no matter what we see there, it, the, the number one issue is, as I'm reading it, is they're having a problem with Yehovah. Moses is, Moses is the one that's the representative, but they're using spiritual sort of issues to, to, to kind of, what do you call that? Um, mask mm-hmm. the issue. You know, they're mm-hmm. not happy. 
They're not happy. <laughs> so what, and they're not happy. And so what you do is you come up with these these issues. But I'm just saying, a psychologist could look at this and really, really, uh, probably analyze this and, and, and give us some but sort it's, of it's official. Yeah, go ahead. It's, I was just going to say, you know, Keith, 250 of them, it certainly seems like uh, there's been a lot of discussion going around the camp. There's been some conspiring, and they've gotten mm. together, and they say, and, and if we go back, Keith, uh, and we see uh, that Yehovah wanted to uh, take them all out, remember, and, and Moses intercedes for the people, and and they because there's a lot of moaning and groaning going on, and obviously that didn't go away. They've conspired against him. They've risen up against him. And they, they've decided, look, put it to him like this. Just put it to him like this. Say, look, Moses and Aaron, you, you, you take too much upon yourselves. And, you know, come on, you know, we're, we, aren't we important too? Aren't we also holy? Haven't we also been set apart? You know, get off your high horse and, and, and let's share around some of, the, uh, some of the glory, if you like. Uh-huh. No, so we, we got this interesting expression here in the end of verse 2, that they're on Sheshem, men of name. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's a phrase that only appears twice in the Bible, and the other places in Genesis chapter six verse four it says there mm-hmm. it was then and later too that the Nephilim appeared on earth when the divine beings this is the JPS when the, literally it says the sons of God the sons of Elohim when the sons of Elohim cohabited with the daughters of men who bore them offspring they were the uh, the mighty men of old the men of name the mm-hmm. Anshe Hashem so there's only two places in the Bible that talks about it and, and you know what we could do is we could develop an entire theology. About how Look, I got one. the um, you got it <laughs> all right, and this is the secret for 1995. <laughs> um, you know, we we could do the whole theology about how the Anshe Shem, the men of name, are there in Genesis six four, the sons of the Nephilim, and they're here in, in Numbers. And those men who were descended from the Nephilim were the ones who rose up against Moses. Now it's theology time. Now we could you know establish an entire denomination around these two words, <laughs> Anshe Shem, men of name. And we, you know, we, we could, we could, that would be our distinctiveness. Uh-huh. And if you wanted to know, you'd have to have that secret knowledge to be part of the group. And, you know, <laughs> I'm saying this half jokingly. This is what like a lot of people will tend to hey, it do. It happens. It happens. So Come on. It, do- it does. I mean, yeah. and what they'll do is, you know, they'll take the most obscure thing possible. And that's the basis of theology. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. There it is. Just when I was going to do a commercial about my new teaching on this, uh, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a new book coming out, <laughs> and Shem Shem. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I do think is I think one of the things one of the things that's been really one of the things that I want to say is that you 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 come across these wonderful uh, little nuggets, and it's hard not to try to make the connection. It's hard not to say so. Why does he say it here, and why does he say it there? Yeah, so enough. you know that that really is a challenge. It is thought provoking. There's no doubt about yeah, it. And- yeah, and there may be a reason why it's here and why it's there that, that we just haven't come up with. But what, what's what's important is to look at these things in context, not just you know take pluck the two words and say we've got the word here and we've got the word there. Now it's the basis of our doctrine. Let's look at the things in context. There it's talking about people who lived you know thousands of years before these people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what, what what could possibly be the connection? And, and the issue here isn't that they're the sons of Nephilim. Here the issue is they're like, well, wait a minute. You know, we were taken out of Egypt. We saw the miracles of the Creator. We, uh, we were, you know, this particular group of uh, people was chosen. They were set apart, the sons of Levi. Why are they being held back as second-class Levites, as, as second-class, essentially, um, priests? Why aren't they getting the full package? Why is only Moses' brother? There might be some nepotism going on there. And, you know, and, um, and the response he gives is, well, it's not about, Mos- it's not about Aaron. It's not about me. This is what Jehovah has chosen. <laughs> you want to challenge it? Bring your incense burner and we'll see. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So we got to read that because uh, that is something to slow down with for a second. Go ahead, go ahead, John. Okay. okay, so he says, uh, tomorrow morning Yehovah will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and your company, put fire in them and put incense in them before Yehovah tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom Yehovah chooses is the holy one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Now, guys, uh, you know, reading that those sentences there, it's kind of clunky in the uh, in the New King James. I don't really understand where he's going with that, particularly at the end where he says, "You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi." How does it read in the Hebrew? Nachem? How do you interpret that? Well, it says "Rav Lachem B'nei Levi," which which um, could be translated a number of ways. It, it is, it, which is probably why it comes out clunky in English. That the Hebrew is is kind of ambiguous. One way to translate this is enough, sons of Levi, enough of this. <laughs> and the other way yeah. to translate is, um, you know, Rob literally means greatness or, uh, you know, greatness for you, the sons of Levi. So there he may be referring to, you know, you've already got the greatness. Why are you, why are you asking, why are you demanding more? Mm-hmm. Why are you demanding more than what God gave you? Who already gave you this gift? 
So there, there's there may even be an intentional ambiguity there. Sure. But uh, you know, um, but definitely that I think just the the immediate kind of plain meaning there would be you know enough enough of you sons of Levi. Fair enough. You know, okay. You've done this enough. And then Moses said to Korah, "Here now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you Come near on. to Himself?" And to do the work of the tabernacle of Jehovah, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that He has brought you near to Himself, you and all the bre- and and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? He says. Now, now for those who haven't listened to the program before, this is a point I'm sure we've made before, which is you know I know in English, um, in the English speaking world, there's very often a a confusion between Levite and Kohen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they, Le- Levite is someone who's a descendant from Levi, um, who is one of the 12 sons of Aaron, uh, excuse me, 12 sons of Jacob and, um, one of the, one of the original 12 tribes and, uh, and then Kohen or priest is a subset mm-hmm. within Levi and that's specifically Aaron and his descendants. And, and I'd given the analogy in the past, uh, con- concerning uh, Georgia, blessed memory, um, mm-hmm. that, you know, my dog, Georgia, who passed away, she was, uh, she was a Ridgeback, um, which is, of course, the most beautiful breed of dogs. <laughs> all Ridgebacks are dogs, but not all dogs are Ridgebacks. And, mm-hmm. and in the same vein, uh-huh. you could say um, all Kohanim, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. And that was exactly the problem here. They said, wait a minute, I'm a Levite. I'm a one of the chosen, the chosen group within the chosen group. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I should be able to, you know, and I've been tasked with carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the holiest object on planet Earth. And you're telling me I can't sprinkle the blood on the altar. I can't, uh, I can't bring the incense into the into the into the tabernacle. I mean, come on, I should, I should, you know, get more than this. And he's saying, look, isn't it enough what you've got? <laughs> But it's not, I mean, Nehemiah and, and Keith, it's not so much that they want yeah. more duties as, as, as at least uh, the, what I'm getting from the text. It's not as if they want more duties or more responsibility. It seems like they want more fame or more recognition for themselves. Do you think that's probably a, a fair analysis of the situation? Um, uh, I'm not so sure this is just about recognition. That was probably part of it. We see that in verse 13. Mm. Um, but there's some authority issues going on here as well. Um, but I think this is also their thing that you know, wow, the, the the you know sons of Aaron, they've got this holy thing, and, and but you know what, Jehovah is amongst us. Why can't we all be holy mm. exactly. in that way? So, I mean, but I, I want to say, Jonah, I, yeah. I just want to say this. I, you know, the thing that I still, um, like I said in the beginning, I think that usually what people, well, not usually, a lot of times what people will do is they'll find one thing and say, okay, here's the reason that we want to bring this to you, but really it's something else, and, and that's why mm-hmm. I said a psychologist could probably come mm-hmm. up with what the official term is, but when you read it, you just get a sense that, is this really your heart that you're saying, uh, look, we're all holy, but yet here you're, you're, you've basically seen, heard, watched all of this that's gone on, and yet you're still standing up and saying, we're going to oppose Moses. Mm. Now, one thing I wanted to, Nehemiah to take, take a quick look at, this is just very, very quick. Nehemiah, I want you to look, if you could, in uh, 16.3, and then in 16, uh, and then 16.7, um, the, the term that's used there, and I know you mentioned it, um, you know, and I, and, and, and the term when they, when he came to Moses, this is just, I think it's interesting in 16, three, mm. if you read in the Hebrew Nehemiah, when they said unto him, what are the two words that is, that's used there? 16, three, and they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, correct? Rav, lech, rav lechem. Yeah. Rav lechem. So Which, they, much they for come you, it's much enough. for you and, and speaking to the plural, speaking in the plural, um, much to you. But then when they, when they bring it up, they say, well, so they say they, they assembled against Moses and Aaron. You've gone too far enough for you. And then he uses the exact same phrase. Mm. So, I mean, it's just, it's just one of those yeah. little things, you know, in other words, they come to him and they said, you know, Rav Lechem. And then Moses comes back and says, no, Rav Lechem. And the very words it, that you used. Throws it back I'm going to, to them, tell right? you exactly the very same words. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. anyway, verse 11, therefore you and your company are gathered together against Jehovah. And what is Aaron that you should complain against him? Yeah, so, right. Now he's sticking up for his brother, right? Fair enough. And, uh, and Moses uh, sent to call Tatan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, and how about this? They said, we will not come up. It, and, and Keith, here, we, here it is again. Now, Moses had said something. He said, uh, let me just go back. He said, it is all right. He said in verse nine. Is it a small thing that uh, to you that yada yada yada? And so on it goes. 
And then here in verse 13, they reply, or they, they will not come up, and they reply, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Now, if I'm to understand this correctly, they're referring to Egypt as a land flowing with milk and <laughs> that's honey. That's right. They're referring to the, <laughs> sure to the Mitzrayim, no, the that's, land that's of... That's a backhand. That's a clear backhand. Land of bondage as <laughs> the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us. Moreover... You have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Well, we, we, we've got to stop there because that, that's a Damn. powerful two verses there. This here, number 16, 13 to 14. Mm. So uh, first of all, I, I love the words that they, they, that they choose when they, um, you know, they're, they're accusing him here. They say, and, and how, how did you translate it there to, to kill us in the desert? What do you have there at the end of verse 13 again? Yeah, I've got uh, to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting yeah. like a prince over us. Acting like a prince over us. And it says, <laughs> that you will uh, lord over us or, or be, a, be a, a prince over us. Mm -hmm. Or uh, or it could also be um, a, a minister of a government, uh, the word sar or even a general. And um, and, and that's, a, that's significant, that word, because... He's been accused of this before. He has <laughs> Exodus two fourteen, I think two fourteen, and and because of that, some some of the Jewish commentators have actually said this isn't his first run in with Datan and Aviram. This is the second run in. That oh. these were the two men that now we don't know that for sure, but this has been suggested. So if we read that in thir uh, Exodus two thirteen to fourteen, it says, uh, and it came to pass in the second day, and behold, two Hebrew men were fighting, and the wicked one, uh, and he said to the wicked one, Why are you smiting your fellow? In verse fourteen, and and uh, and he said that is this this guy who's beating up his friend. Mm. He said, uh, "Who has made you as a as a, a prince and a judge over us? Uh, are you are you uh, going to kill us or plotting to kill us as you uh, as you killed the Egyptian?" Mm -hmm. um, so so they he's been accused before of, of being this prince over the people, the prince of Egypt, and uh, <laughs> and um, and so some people have actually said that the two men over there in Exodus two. Uh, thirteen to fourteen are the same two men here, Datan and Aviram, and this is their old shtick. That you well, know, that, you know, that, that's what, an interesting uh, way to look at it because I mean that was yeah. the catalyst for Moses. It goes on to say that Moses fled mm -hmm. from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. So he he was yeah. off, and and perhaps they were hoping, hey, if we play this card again, he'll be gone. And that's what yeah. that's what I want to say. The psycholo the psychologist in me, though I'm not one, it says <laughs> even if it wasn't those two men. You, you find the hook. So mm -hmm. let's just say that the, the public relations on Moses says, look, if you want to get him, just bring up what happened when he, when he, when he had to flee Egypt. Sure. <laughs> you, know, you know, use the same accusation. They do that with politicians all the time. Sure. You know, the politician will be going along and he'll get favored and then they'll say, but don't you remember when? Or don't mm -hmm. you remember when you said this? Right. And so it's, a very po it's very possible that it is the two or maybe it's and, just yeah. something and, that... But even, that if it's, it, yeah. even if it's a different two, there's definitely the issue here that they're... They're bringing up the old baggage, mm -hmm. which is you exactly. know, this is what you did. This is what you did before. You're, you're gonna you're you're gonna kill us. Like mm. You killed that Egyptian guy. Is that what you're gonna do? You know, that, that's kind of what the, you know. Datan of Iram are by, by using this terminology, they're alluding back to that other incident and that mm. earlier accusation. Sure. And, and then I love the end of verse 14, where it says literally, uh, um, you know, uh, are, you, are you gonna poke out the eyes of these men of those men? What does that mean? Poke out the eyes of those men, and and, um, and and also their choice of word, where they say uh, we will not go up. Is it not is it not enough that you brought us up out of Egypt? Why did they say go up? Why did they say come? And I think that's a very um, uh, strategically chosen word, because in Hebrew you always talk about going up to the land of Israel, mm -hmm. and whenever you leave Israel, it's going down. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when they said we will not go up, I think that had a a, a double meaning there. They're saying we're not going to come and appear before you. And we ain't going up. We're not going to that land that you want to take us to where we're mm -hmm. going to, you know, get consumed by the giants. We want to go back to Egypt. And and then when he says, uh, you know, what do you guys think he means when he says, are you going to poke out the eyes of these men? What, what do you think he means by that? I don't know. I, I just guess it's an expression of, of I don't know. Keith, what, what do you make of it? Uh, that, great question. I'd like to hear the answer. Go on. Well, so I, I don't, I'm not saying I have the answer, but when I read this, what I'm thinking is, you know, um, uh, what, what I think they're saying is that everyone can see we're not going to the land of, of Canaan, that we're not going to the land of milk and honey. Uh, you're going to have to poke our eyes out because we can see with our with our own two eyes that that what you promised isn't materializing. And uh, and so I think that's you know what they're saying. They're saying you know you're just going to have to poke our eyes out. 
because we're, we're not blind. We can see what's going on. You've taken us into the desert, and we're never getting out of this desert. You're telling us yourself we're not getting out of the desert. We're going to die here. You're going to have to blind us, poke our eyes out mm. for us to not see what's going on here. And, uh, and, and I think on that note, where we're talking about poking eyes out, we, we, you know, I think now is a good time for us to pray. Hey, excellent. And ask mm-hmm. Jehovah, nice transition rather than there. poke our eyes out. To open our eyes. Amen. Keith, would you, would you lead us in prayer? Yes, yes, absolutely. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity, and, and we want to be people who do see, and we want to see according to what you have for us. So open our eyes that we might see the wonderful things that are hidden in your Torah. Mm. Amen. 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 And Amen. I guess, I, I mean, I don't know if this is, I mean, this is, this is a stretch, and this is speculation, uh, and it doesn't say anything of the sort. But in verse 12 of uh, chapter 2 in Exodus, so he looked this way and that, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Uh, it says nothing about um, uh, poking out his eyes, but, I mean, who knows how he died? Who knows how the Egyptian died? Who, how, how Moses mm-hmm. killed him? We don't know. But um, it, you never know. They might have been just fueling the fire. In any case, Moses is, uh, is none too happy. It says, then Moses was very angry. And said to Yehovah, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey for them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow, you and all your company be present before Yehovah. You and they, as well as Aaron, let each take his censer and put incense in it. And each of you bring his censer before Yehovah. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire on it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron, And Korah gathered all the congregation. He gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory. One second. One second. Jonah, and I know this is a, this is, so, so if I'm reading this now, just, just read this with me for a Mm -hmm. second. So if I'm reading this, I hear first Moses say tomorrow in verses four through seven, Mm -hmm. he tells them, bring your censors. There it is. Then there's a discussion back and forth. Moses also said to them, now listen, isn't it enough for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then Moses summoned them. Mm-hmm. So he says, we will not come. So here you have, so if it's the same day now, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. If it's the same day, Moses says, look, you guys bring your census tomorrow. Now, Dathan, you and Kor, uh, 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 Aviram, uh, Aviram, come, come here. I want to talk to you. And they said, we're not coming. So then Moses goes again. Okay, okay, here's the deal. Now, you and your followers are to appear before Yehovah tomorrow, you and they and Aaron. Each man is to take his censor. So here's my question. If they've already said they're not coming, does that mean they're willing to have the public challenge, but they don't want to have pri- pr- uh, private records? Like, in other words, was, was, hmm. was Moses saying, hey, you two, look, now the thing, it's going down tomorrow. It's going to go down tomorrow. Get the censors. Now, in the meantime, hey, you two, come here. Let's talk. We're not coming. Sure. Was that an opportunity? Was he trying, that, you, know, that could words, have been, you know what? This is the first Moses time I thought about that. Guys, but, guys yeah. listen, it's going to go down tomorrow. Come and talk. You know, it's almost like, and I don't want to go too far in this, but it's almost like he's like, okay, look, we've got a, we've got a public problem that's going here. Let's see if we can deal with this privately. Mm-hmm. And they said, we ain't doing it. We want to have the public contest. I mean, that, I mean just think about that. You're on, you're on Moses' home court. You're on Moses' you – know, in yeah. other words, Moses is saying, let's deal with this this way. You go ahead and get your censors. Here's what we're going to do. But in the meantime, let's work it out. And I'm not saying that he's saying it, but otherwise I'm asking the question, why does that happen between these two, these two mm-hmm. instructions to, to get the censors? And, and that may also have to do with in verse 14 where, where they talk about, you know, they say you're going to blind, uh, you know, poke out the eyes of these men. Mm-hmm. Um, meaning uh, what that might mean is, you know, everyone's looking, everyone's watching. Right. I'm exactly. not gonna, we're not going to let we're not let you we're not going to let you do this in private, right? And, right. and you know, behind you, closed you know, doors. Yes, exactly. everyone's going to see what's going to happen. Yep. Yeah. 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 That that yeah. makes yeah. sense. That and makes so, the, and so that the court date is set, but in the meantime, Moses says, oh, "Come on, oh, let's be oh, reasonable." Hold on. We, we, we got to go back to verse 15. I love verse 15. Yeah. Where he says, "I have not taken a donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them," and and that's later repeated in the time of Samuel. And so, if we could just pop over real quick, one sure. Samuel chapter 12, verse three. Uh, let me read this here, and uh, and here this is a situation where where Samuel is is um, you know uh, uh, standing before the people, and he says, "Behold," he says, "Here I am. Answer me," or te- could also be translated, "Testify against me mm-hmm. before Jehovah and before His Messiah. Whose ox have I taken, and whose donkey have I taken, and who have I oppressed, and who have I persecuted, mm-hmm. and from the hand of who have I taken a um, a, a bribe?" Mm-hmm. You can translate it as that I have hidden my eye against him, uh, that I may, and I will return it to you. 
And he's saying, look, I haven't, you, you've rejected me as your prophet and you wanted a king instead. So now testify against me in the presence of Yehovah, in the presence of his Mashiach. Mm -hmm. and at that time, of course, so. Mashiach, he's talking about King Saul, mm -hmm. who a few chapters earlier, he had anointed as king over Israel, poured oil on his head. And Mashiach, of course, means the anointed one. He literally mm -hmm. anointed him with oil. Mm -hmm. He's saying, come and testify against me and tell me who I've wronged here, who I've stolen from. Uh, in the presence of Yehovah and his Mashiach. And, um, and it's essentially uh, kind of echoing the words of Moses, I mean, mm. almost literally, you know, whose donkey have I taken? You know, which I guess was a big deal, like to take a donkey back then. Sure. Um, or maybe that was a small matter. And they're saying, I haven't even taken a donkey, let alone anything else. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think this is a beautiful verse here, though, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3, because if I'm going to be so bold, I, I, I think that what we have here might be a picture of the final judgment where testimony will be born in the presence of Jehovah and his Messiah. I reckon that's fair, actually. Okay. I yeah. think so. I think, it's, I think it's a picture of the final judgment. Sure. <laughs> there we go. And Moses said is. to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company be present. Before... Now we've done that one. Okay. So the glory of Jehovah appeared to all the congregation. And Jehovah's sp oh, man, boy, oh boy, don't you think you'd feel like you were in trouble then? And Jehovah spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. So again, he was going to, it was like, you know, I've had enough. I'm going to wipe them out. I'll, I'll make another nation out of you and Aaron probably. But uh, they fell on their faces and said, oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So Yehovah spoke to Moses. Can we stop there for a second? Sure. I, I feel like we need to slow down. There's two things here that are really powerful. One is this phrase, uh, El Elohei HaRuchot Lechol Basar, um, which you translate literally, Mighty One, the God of the spirits of all flesh. Mm -hmm. Which, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do you not get excited? Oh, my. I, 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 I love, you know. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and that only appears twice in the Bible. The other place is Numbers 27, 16. Um, mm -hmm. So only twice. And that's, you know, do we have that phrase where God is referred to as El Elohe Uchot Lechol Basar. Actually, 27, 16, he's called Yehovah Elohe Uchot Lechol Basar. His specific mm -hmm. name is, he's not just El, the mighty one, God. Mm -hmm. He's Yehovah, mm -hmm. the God mm -hmm. of the spirits of all flesh. That's, that's a, I think, a powerful image there. Mm -hmm. And then also it says, shall one man sin? And the entire congregate, and you'd be angry against the entire congregation. And of course, this reminds me immediately of, of the negotiation that Abraham had hundreds of years earlier, maybe uh, yeah, many hundreds of years earlier, mm -hmm. with um, with uh, God over over Sodom and Gomorrah. Sure. Where he's trying to negotiate, he's saying, "Well, what well, if there's fifty righteous people? You're not going to kill everybody, mm -hmm. right? Let's kill the, only the righteous people." And and you know, this reminds me of something in Jewish history, which if I could just take a quick tangent here. Which is uh there there was this group uh, of people after the Holocaust who called themselves the Avengers Hanokmim and um, they actually uh, they were Jews who had survived the Holocaust and um, they decided they were going to kill as many Germans as they could and they actually uh, hatched a plot to uh, poison the water supply of Hamburg and kill maybe hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. and um, in the end their plot was foiled by you know, they, they needed the poison and they went to the Jewish leaders in Israel and the Jewish leaders in Israel said, you know, what are you crazy? <laughs> there, there's people who are criminals and we're going to go after those criminals. We're going to hunt them to the ends of the earth, mm -hmm. but we're not going to kill innocent people who, um, you know, who didn't, didn't commit these crimes. Sure. And, and I, and I think that, you know, here is where they learn this concept that if one man sins, you don't go kill everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know what that reminds me of now, just the two uh, yeah. uh, connections that you made there. Nehemiah, uh, and where it says uh, the God of the spirits of all flesh um, takes me to Ezekiel 18 verse 4, uh, where he says, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine and that the, uh, the soul who sins shall die and that the children do not do not pay for the sins of the father and, and vice versa. But uh, it just reminded me of that anyhow. There so, so Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Tatan, and Abi Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Tatan, Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, depart now from the tents of the wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sin. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Tatan, and Abiram. And Tatan and Abiram 
came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that Jehovah has sent me to you to do all these works, for I have not done them by my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then Jehovah has not sent me. But if Jehovah creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected Jehovah. Do you have pit in yours, Johnson? Verse 30. It is, uh, but if the Lord brings out something totally new, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the grave. Sheol. Grave, the Hebrew. grave. And the Hebrew has Sheol, and Sheol in, in the Tanakh is... is um, Basically, Sheol is this, this uh, spiritual realm where people, where their spirits go when they die. Mm-hmm. You know, when you in in the way it's described in the Tanakh, uh, you know, in in the um, Greek, uh, this is usually translated in, in like for example, in the New Testament, it'll talk about Hades, mm-hmm. but it's really uh, a tra- attempting to translate into Greek terms the Hebrew concept of Sheol, and Sheol is simply the realm of the dead. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things we know about Sheol, we're told by um, by uh, King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I know this is a little off topic, but let's really quickly read what he says, his conclusion there. Um, it's Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and it says, um, verse 10, it says, All that you find in your hand to do with your, uh, uh, with your to do, do with your might. Mm-hmm. For there is no action or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, to which you are going. And earlier in the chapter of Ecclesiastes 9, he tells us everyone goes to the same place. Mm-hmm. With everyone, good or bad, when right? With the righteous or they, they're unfathful, the wicked, everyone, they all go to Sheol. Everyone, everyone goes to Sheol. Amen. Um, now, you might ask, well, okay, so so what's the advantage of being righteous or unrighteous? You know, why bother? And my first answer to that is don't do it for the reward. Uh, there's an ancient Jewish proverb that says, uh, you know, don't serve the master in order to get reward, serve the master, uh, not to get the reward, just because you love him, and the master being, you know, the creator of the universe, Yehovah. Um, but on top of that, we do have this concept of uh, the final judgment, mm-hmm. where um, where it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, some shall arise uh, uh, for eternal life, and uh, some for eternal uh, contempt for derision. Mm-hmm. So there'll be this final judgment in which uh, those who are sleeping in Sheol, whose souls are you know, down there in Sheol, essentially in a state of unconsciousness, as Ecclesiastes described it, mm. will be awoken, and, will, and there will be a final judgment. Mm. Amen. And yeah. it's an interesting thing. Is, I'm, I'm glad you picked that up. Keith, I, I did do a search on that in, uh, in the King James. And in the King mm-hmm. James, that word, that uh, Sheol, is translated, I think, 30-odd times as grave, as it says in your translation. Uh, another uh, 30-odd times as hell! And uh, mm-hmm. three times as the pit. And uh, it's interesting mm-hmm. that they should put hell in there. They went down into hell! Mm-hmm. They did. But, yes. Uh, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to do, do something. And, you know, this, this, this whole story, and I'm going to keep saying the, thing, the same thing, this whole story really um, just uh, makes me think a lot about groupthink and what's going on and, and all of that. So I'm going to back away from that and just let the Bible speak for a second. There's something else that really... Um, comes across in this story that I think is important. And that is that uh, there, there, there's one little item that Moses asked them to do. And then he, this is the issue. He says, so bring your censer. Mm-hmm. Now, when I hear censer, obviously what I want to know is, so what's this issue with the censer? And there's this great story, you guys. I mean, this story is one that I remember uh, from a long, long time ago in Second Chronicles 26, 19. The man named Uzziah, who had a similar situation with the censer. And what he did was... He, he brought out his censer, and he was basically trying to you know, establish his authority, both as king and priest. And it says in uh, 26, 19, it says, Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priest, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of Yehovah, beside the altar of incense. And if you read the entire story, you understand what's going on. But there's this issue again of the censer. So Moses says to them, listen, he could have said this. He could have said, hey, listen, guys. You want to have a contest? Just be like Elijah. Elijah says it's time for Yehovah to choose between us and between them, where the mm-hmm. fire is going to fall down. That, you know, instead, Moses does something really interesting. He says, okay, tell you what. You guys want to determine who's going to be holy? You want to determine who's going to be the priest? Grab a censer. And so what was the censer? So then they have the censer. 
the fire and the incensor, the incense. I, I've seen this. I've I've seen this at different times. And there's another thing in Ezekiel eight eleven. It also talks about this standing in front of them were seventy elders of the house of Israel with uh, Jazaniah the son of uh, Shaphan standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. Mm -hmm. So what's the picture? So the picture is almost like this. We know that Moses had a conversation, uh, Panim El Panim, I think it is a face-to-face -face with Yehovah, conversation with him. They had dialogue back and forth. So Moses says this, you think that I'm going too far? You think me selecting uh, Aaron going too far? Let's pick, let's, let's use this symbol of prayer of incense. Let's use this to be the thing. You go ahead and put your fire in there. Let's meet out here and then let the choice be made. When I see that, I think to myself, okay, what, what, where do we see that in other places? And again, the story in Second Chronicles 26 is, mm. is interesting because Uzziah is saying, I'm going to prove to you that I'm both king and priest. I've got my censer in my hand for burning incense. My prayers are accepted, just like he smells that, you know, this, this instance. So, so, and again, I might be going too far here, but there's something that, that really, really hit me uh, about, about a month ago. And that is going to bring up the story when I was in Rome. So one of the things uh, about Rome and, and that we also see in Jerusalem, if you go to the church of the Holy Sepulcher or many other churches, uh, and I was, I wasn't being funny. I was, I was, <laughs> I was watching a procession at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and as I'm there, it's a really phenomenal place because in it, you've got six different denominations, two different calendars, and everybody's basically marching around to determine who's got the better parade, and I'm not trying to be funny. Right. So, you know, you've got one denomination coming in, another denomination coming in. Uh, when I say denomination, I'm talking about these different groups, Greek Orthodox, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that they do is they put the incense in their little – this little the deal, and they, and they swing it back and forth, and the, and the smell goes up. And to be honest, I mean, Nehemiah, you, you know this because you've been in there many times – but when I walk in there, it like it's not it's not a, a smell that's uh, pleasing. It's really quite toxic. So you know, and they're they're basically having their sensor and they're swinging it back and forth. And I guess that's supposed to make me stand back and say, okay, their prayers are being accepted. I'm not sure what it is, but it, it's not like I said. It gets my eyes a little bit watery. But the image of Moses selecting the sensor is significant mm. because what did the sensor? represent and why did he pick that why didn't he say okay you guys everyone bring your uh talit or everyone bring your whatever why mm -hmm. the censor so i just think i just think the whole thing is interesting that he picked that and again second chronicles kind of gives me a gives me a parallel to look at thank you thank you for that for that reference and so it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah. And all their goods. And so, mm. so they and all those that were with them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed over them, Keith. My goodness, the earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at that cry for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. They were gone. The earth swallowed yeah. them. They were swallowed by the earth. So, and yet, and yet we well, have this, and this, yeah. is a, this is a complicated one. Just going to bring it up. So is it our understanding that, uh, that, that all of the entire family of those men went down into the earth? It, it doesn't say explicitly, I suppose, but it certainly implies because there they were at the tent. It, and, and it makes a point of saying, doesn't it, in uh, verse 27. Wives and their children. The wives, their sons, and their little children, to illustrate it even further. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like they were all, they all went down alive into the pit. And uh, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Now that's really now no, no, hold on a second. Can we jump ahead to uh, Numbers chapter twenty six, mm -hmm. right? Um, where, where the story is being regurgitated. There it uh, is. It's it's being retold again. You got parallel passages. You got to read all of them. Mm -hmm. Chapter uh, twenty six verses nine to eleven. Maybe one of you guys could read that. You got a case? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let's see. Verse 9, and the sons of Eliab were Nimuel, Dathan, and Abraham, the same. That's Dathan and Abraham uh, were the community officials who rebelled against Moses and Aaron and were among Korah's followers when they rebelled against the Lord. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them along with Korah, whose followers died when the fire devoured the 250 men. Mm -hmm. And they served as a warning sign. The line mm -hmm. of Korah did not die out. Ah, verse 11. There it is. Read verse what do you got in, in the, 11 the line there, of Korah, however, did not die out. Right. Well, is that what it says in yours? <laughs> what? Let me, no, no, let me tell you what I've got. I've got here in verse 11, it says, Nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. Uh -huh. uh, there it is. 
literally you could say the sons of Korach didn't die. So there were these people who um, who were connected to Korach who said, you know, our, our, our dad's wrong. We, we can't be involved in this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that becomes a, a very important thing later on because if you go to the Psalms, you'll read, for example, Psalm 42 says, uh, for the conductor, a maskil, which is a certain type of psalm, for the sons of uh, of the of the sons of Korach. So we've got one, two, Psalm 42, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 84, 85, 87. These are all psalms of the sons of Korach. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then finally uh, 88. So we've got 11 psalms that are written uh, and performed and sung by the sons of Korach. So although their father, you know, and, and it's just like the verse you were talking about in Ezekiel, Jono, where it talks about if the, if the if the father sins mm-hmm. and the son repents, the son doesn't carry that that sin with him, and that's exactly what happened with the sons of Korach. Mm-hmm. Their father sinned. They said, "We need to step away from here. This isn't. We don't believe in what he's doing. He's wrong about this." And they were righteous, and they were spared, and they became the authors of eleven psalms. There it is. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Thank Amen. you for that. And a fire came out from Yehovah and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, Tell Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest to pick up the censers. Get this, Keith. Pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering. Now, Nehemiah, a covering for the altar. What is that? What do you got there? Yeah, well, Rikua, uh, Rikua, uh, Tsipui, rather, is, yeah, covering. But but I want to go, read, Keith, could you read verses 2 and 3 in your translation? This, this is really interesting how you translated it. 2 and 3 of what? Ver, of Numbers 17, the chapter that we're in. Two, what are you talking about? I'm, numbers what? 2 and 3? What are you talking about, Nehemiah? <laughs> Isn't that, we're in 16. There? Wait, wait. What are you talking okay. about? We're in 16, 33, and 34. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's why I'm, I'm looking. I'm, f- I'm following the verse that Jonah's reading. I'm like, mine is so different. I can't believe it. It's because you're in the wrong chapter. And now, now I know why I'm in the right chapter. There it is. Okay. Moving right along. Okay, so he made it. He made a covering for the altar. Because... Wait, so what verse funny. are you in? No, no, you got to keep this. No, this is funny. I mean, so, 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 so Jonah says, no, you, this is classic. So Jonah reads verse, and he says, what does it say in Hebrew? And Nehemiah is like, Boy, I tell you what, those English translations are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> now, hold on a second. What I, no, hold on. Before, before you guys make fun of me, um, hold on. So number 17, chapter 1 in, uh, or excuse me, chapter 17, verse 1 in the Hebrew is in the King James Version, in the, your English, number 1636. So I'm actually right. When I say verses Whoa, 2 to 3, and 34. those are the verse numbers in the Hebrew. In, uh, in yours, that's verses 37 to 38. So I'm oh, actually right. Yeah, I'm in the right chapter. Really... <laughs> no, no. So I was right. I'm just looking at the Hebrew text. I don't know what it says in the English. I got to pull it up here in my little program. <laughs> so what I want you to read, Keith, it is the same verses. Read verses okay. 37 to 38, which in the Hebrew is 17 to 3. So let's just say this. We're both right. Okay. We're in we're 16, the English. I'm you right said based on the Hebrew. And you're right, and you're right, right based on the nearly inspired yeah. version. Okay, got you. So tell Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, to take the censers out of the smoldering remains and scatter the coals some distance away, for the censers are holy. The censers are the men who sinned at the cost of their lives. Hammer and censers, the censers into sheets of overlay the altar, and to overlay the altar, for they were presented before Yehovah and have become holy. Uh, for the censers are holy, the censers are the men who sinned at the cost of their lives. And what Jonah read is something a little bit different, which is um, uh, the censers are these men who sinned against their own souls. Yeah. Let them be made into a hammer. So that's actually quite different, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. And what, what you could translate this. And, and look, so I'll admit here, the Hebrew is, is complicated. And what makes it complicated is it, it appears that verse 2 continues in mid-sentence into verse 3. And um, and that's, that's where I think the confusion enters. But the way I would translate this is um, uh, for the censors of the sinners... Uh, the censors of these sinners have been sanctified by their lives, by the cost of their lives. Um, so, in yeah. other words, uh, they the they they sanctified these sinners by, or excuse me, they the sinners sanctified these censors by losing their lives um, when they offered mm-hmm. them. Wow! Mm-hmm. And so they hammered wow. those censors into some sort of covering for the altar, right? Yeah. See, point. Okay. That's a- Yep. So Eliezer, so, and the, again, and again, you guys, I think one of the keys, again, the reason I brought up this issue of the censor earlier, and that Moses picked that. Think about it; mm. he picks that 
that becomes the issue that um, that's the sort of symbol. Whose prayers are we going to uh, receive in the situation? But then to make those censers into something for the altar, just to me, is is really powerful. Like, it is, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's like these are this is this this was rebellion. But we're going to take hmm. the censers because the censers themselves were holy. So think of it. Moses tells them, "Bring this holy thing." The very thing that they brought. There's a, there's a separation between the two and mm-hmm. the very issue that they brought, which was this: Are you the only ones that are holy? We also are holy. Okay, bring the censers, and those censers end up being used on the altar. That is that's amazing to me. Now, now how did they fall for this? That's what I want to know. Because didn't that's they remember? Mind. I'm telling didn't you, the they, didn't, didn't they remember what happened with Nadav and Avihu? But it's, brought, but it's not... you know, who got burned yeah, sure. up because they brought the the strange incense. I mean, how strange fire, bring, yeah, strange fire. To, I mean, what this tells me is they were really confident in their in their cause. And you know, mm. Keith made, made the remark before that they were against Yehovah, but I don't. I don't think that's fair. I think they were. They thought that Yehovah was on their side, because you know they had they had a justification. They were justifying sure. in their minds. You know, God's on our side. We're, you know, we're in the right. They're backslapping. They're backslapping him, saying, calling the calling no, Egypt the land of milk. And no, they're, and they're they're backslapping Moses and saying, you know, we we can see the presence of Yehovah. We can sense that. We feel that. We see it going on. You know, but you Moses. We trust in Yehovah. It's you we don't trust, Moses. Mm. And so he says, okay, well, let, let's test that. Bring your censors. I think mm. I know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they made the covering for the altar because they presented them before Yehovah. Therefore, they are holy. And they and, shall... And I got to add one more thing, which is what Moses says. And maybe we didn't get to this yet. Um, let's see. You know, I think we read this part. Um, that uh, No, we didn't. So where, where Moses prays to Yehovah and says, don't accept their incense. Yeah, that's right. Please don't accept their incense, which, mm-hmm. you know, which I think confirms that, you know, these people in their minds, they were in the right. It wasn't like they said, OK, that God of Israel, you know, he he's not up to snuff. So we're going to appoint a new leader and get a new God. And no, they're saying Moses is claiming to speak for the God of Israel, but we mm-hmm. see him speaking to all of us. So we're all holy. Let's all have this uh, ability to interact with God. And it's not really, you know, Keith, you mentioned before about prayers. I mean, I think Yehovah accepts prayers from everybody. Um, uh, and I think you'd agree with that. But here, he was very specific about incense. So specific mm-hmm. that even Aaron's two sons, who were part of the people who were allowed to bring incense, but they brought it at the wrong time and in the wrong yes. circumstances, mm-hmm. they were burned up. And so, and so, you know, this is something where God has got all these rules and regulations. You know, we read in Exodus and we tried not to, you know, to like, you know, to, to like fall asleep while we're reading this. And, you know, because it's like so much detail, but then, but then when, when it comes to applying that detail, the detail is important. He gave you the detail because the detail is important. And, and I think that's the point here that, um, that, you know, these people were claiming, oh, well, you know, who cares about the details? We feel God's love. We see his, his miracles. Mm-hmm. We don't need the details. We, you know, because we've got direct access to God. Who needs those details? And mm-hmm. Moses is like, okay, you want to test that? We've seen, we've been let's, through this story before. You're going to see what's going to happen. Let's do it again. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, now just, Nehemiah, let's just, yeah. uh, hang on, before we go further, because you just said something, and I just want to jump off the topic for a second and clarify what you said. You said that, that uh, Yehovah hears all, all prayers. Uh, that he accepts all prayers. Um, Proverbs 28, verse 9, how do you understand this? That the one who turns away his ear from hearing Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. Well, okay. but, but, so let me let me clarify what I'm trying to say is that he mm-hmm. he hears the prayers of uh, of all people, meaning all people have the potential to have their 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 prayers heard. And, mm-hmm. and I don't think Keith meant this, but it could have been taken, uh, Keith's words could have been taken out of context to mean that, oh, you know, Jehovah is only going to accept the prayer prayers of a priest. And and I don't think anybody would really say that. That's definitely not the case. Mm-hmm. Even though there are you know there there are probably you know groups who would say that oh well you've got you gotta you know be the ordained person in order to make the proper prayers. What are you uh, talking you know, about? Effect- you gotta be a Methodist if you want to hear if you, you want prayers heard. <laughs> okay, you got you got to be properly ordained. <laughs> but I, I think anybody who reads scripture is going to see okay obviously Yehovah accepts everyone's prayers um, if they come to him with humility and righteousness and you know or, mm-hmm. you know Amen. so. So a person can inval- can get themselves invalidated, uh, their you know their ability to to uh, submit prayers to him invalidated. But everyone has that potential. That's my point. Mm-hmm. 
Mm, and I, and I, let me just say this. You know, again, and, and this is how, I hope people are getting this as we're going through the Torah portions because it's a very, very powerful concept. I keep talking about it almost every week where there's sort of the line, the, the, the thing that jumps off the page, you know, help us to see the hidden. You know, we, we talk about this all the time. But if I were to go on anything that we've talked about so far, and, you know, when you're a speaker, you'll, you'll say to people, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. And so, mm-hmm. it, and Yehovah does this in this chapter, which I think it's a long chapter. If you start at 16 and you start talking about, Korah and Datan and Abraham and you're reading 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 and then it gets to the end of verse uh, 40 and it says this this was to remind the Israelites that no one except a descendant of Aaron should come to burn incense before Yehovah or he would become like Korah and his followers Mm -hmm. so no matter what we would say he's probably speaking speaking again and why they overlaid this over the altar so imagine this when you come and you see this, what is you? See, it's, it's like the tzitzit. When I see the That's tzitzit, right. it reminds me of this. When mm-hmm. I see the cloud falling down, when I see the ark going forward, when I see these things, this is what it reminds me of. And here mm-hmm. he says, when you see this, let it remind you something. <laughs> there's Aaron mm-hmm. and his sons, <laughs> and then there's the Levites, and then there's the – I mean, so I think that's an important line that uh, that, that, that he's leading us to. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. And even after all of that, fellas, even after all of that, it says mm-hmm. in verse 41, the first four words I have is, on the next day. Uh-oh. The very next day, mm-hmm. Keith, I can't believe it, on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you've killed the people of Jehovah. And now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned towards the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of Jehovah appeared. Now, the last three times this happened, it wasn't good, okay? No. And then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting and Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, get away from among the congregation that I may consume them. And they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, quick, take a censer and put fire on it from the altar and put incense on it. And take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from Jehovah. The plague has begun. Mm. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded, and he ran to the midst of the assembly, and already the plague had begun from uh, among the people. So he put the incense. Can you imagine? In, can, can you imagine? imagine? He put I mean, it in the just incense, dropping. He, he made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague stopped. Now, those who had died in the plague were, get this, 14,700 besides those who died in, in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague had stopped. Oh, my goodness. Under Just under 15,000 people. And, I, and when, I, when I read that, again, what, one of the things that I'm dealing with is this idea of him <clears throat> grabbing the, the, um, the censer. So mm. here, here again now, you've got the censer, and he says, and he takes the censer, and he, he puts incense in it, and runs in the midst of the people. So can you imagine? Can you get the picture of what Aaron's doing? I mean, oh, it, the the urgency is just yeah, incredible in that yeah. in those people. And what the plague must have been? I mean, boom, they're dropping just like that. Click, 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 mm. click. I mean, that's under just under fifteen thousand people total. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a matter of what what appears to be minutes, maybe even seconds. Uh, Nahemio. Yeah, it's gotta hurt. <laughs> it's gotta hurt. <laughs> on, on the other hand. You've got you know six hundred thousand um, warriors, which is something like three thousand people, three million people in the whole uh, the whole the whole nation. Sure. So fourteen thousand, it's a lot, but you know, I mean, I mean, it is a lot. I mean, let's think about nine eleven, where three thousand people were killed in a country of mm-hmm. three hundred million. So that that was significant. So fourteen thousand, mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not dismissing that. On the other hand, he could have killed you know in a blink of an eye, without a problem, he could have killed mm-hmm. you know three hundred thousand or or you know. I mean, he, he was ready to kill. Um, all of them. He was talking about killing all of them except for Moses sure. and Aaron. <laughs> and, mm. You know, so so I think we should, you know, look, look at the. I like to look at the cup half full. So I, I don't know sure. how you look at the cup half full in this situation, and here's why. You, you know, be 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 any one of those people that are <laughs> the fourteen thousand nine fifty, or be any of those that are connected to it. Like it's like it's like. So they were they were upset over the killing of 250. So in other words, yes. 250 died, and they said, you've killed the Lord's people. And from them saying that, now take 250 and multiply it. You know, 15,000 divided by 250, how many what, what, How many hundreds of percentage is that? So again, I, I understand the whole issue of the total, but I'm dealing with this issue of death. I mean, just just be the, be there amongst those people. You come out, you, there's a little, there's a fight there's 250 people rising up against Moses. Oh, there's another fight against Moses. Okay, what's going to happen? Moses is going to pray for them. It'll be okay. Nope. We're going to have a contest. 
They come out and they're dead. And the people are like, what the heck? Because remember now, when they died, the people fled. Mm -hmm. This was like a mm -hmm. traumatic situation. This wasn't just, okay, you know, hey, this is uh, – you guys come over here. You guys come over there. Not, the earth opened up. And mm -hmm. then from the earth opening up, just when we get over that, now we got plague. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I could imagine, I could imagine that. If, causing if let's people. just do a little bit of math here, and I think I've got this right. If, if it, it had taken, let's say, an enormous amount of time, and the urgency that we read these verses, right. let's say it took about twenty-five minutes for mm -hmm. uh, for Moses to get this together, get the instruction to Aaron for Aaron to run out and take right. the censer and put incense on it. And we're still talking about every second, ten people dropping dead. That's what I'm saying. Are you kidding me? I mean, wow. that would just be dramatic. I mean, I mean, boom, 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 boom. So, yeah. I mean, I can't Every imagine. second, 10 people yeah, dropping dead in the space of 25 minutes. It's, in, it's amazing. Yeah, that's that's, that's well, impressive math. Now, listen, um, you were talking about object <laughs> lessons before, Keith. We're talking about the uh, the covering uh, uh, that's hammered out of the uh, the senses and so on and so forth. Here's another one, and, and chapter 17 is dedicated to it. And Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and get from them a rod from each father's house, all their leaders according to their father's house. Twelve rods, write each man's name on his rod, and you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi, for there shall be one rod for the head of each mm -hmm. father's house. Then mm -hmm. you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting before uh, the testimony where I meet with you. And it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they have made against you. You know, ever since I, I, I really, really took the Torah as to be the living word of God, and it not just being some sort of book for great stories, but it really is the word of God, there are times when I will read uh, some section of the Bible, and I have to get up from my chair and walk away. And, and you know, Nakani <laughs> and I had this happen. i got to tell this story, because when we were writing the book, A Prayer to Our Father, Hebrew Origins of the Lord's Prayer, which is now in Chinese, and we're going to be going to China, and ladies mm. and gentlemen, we're going to ask for you to enter in with us in prayer and support. That's going to be something I want to talk about at the end of the show, but I want to say something, Jonah, because this is cool. We would be reading the – we would be studying together. Now, just imagine this picture. He's over here in the United States. We never attempted to write a book. All we were doing first was just doing study, sincere mm -hmm. study. So we hold him. We're in my dining room table. We got three computers, seven books. We're sitting there. Nehemiah's drinking his coffee. I'm fasting. It's an amazing experience. <laughs> I'm, just <kidding. laughs> I'm just kidding. No, we're, we're having lunch together. We're eating. And sometimes one of us would stop <laughs> and get up and leave the table. And because we'd have to leave the table because the revelation was just so amazing. So Nehemiah, after a while, he ended up doing the same thing. He'd get up, he'd walk out, walk out my front door, and start dancing. <laughs> and that's kind of what I want to do right now because <laughs> when I read these sections, when I hear this stuff, I'm thinking, man, doesn't anybody want to just stop, get up, go out the front door and start dancing? He says, listen, mm. he says, he says this, he says, the staff belonging to the one man I choose will sprout. And then Amen. I, and here's my point, I will rid myself. Wait a minute. Can I say that again? Yehovah says this. The staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout. He doesn't say mm -hmm. this. And then Moses, you won't have to hear the grumbling. He says, I'm going to rid myself of this constant grumbling. Mm. Point being made. Yehovah is like, listen, they can say what they want to say. They can say it how they want to say it. They're grumbling against me and I've had mm -hmm. it. I mean, it's like, I, mean, I just mm -hmm. think that is so amazing. And he's like, look, I'm going to rid myself you, of these complaints. Yeah. I'm going to rid myself. He's taking it personal, for goodness sakes. And, like, and you know what else he says here? Keith is in verse 5, and you, and you said, yours has got sprouted, right? I've got uh, uh, the, the, the rod that blossoms. But yeah, exactly. what actually happens in the end, uh, we read from verse 8, now it came to pass that on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted, and put forth buds, and Come had on. produced blossoms, and yielded ripe almonds. <laughs> That's how, amazing. Man, I wonder how they taste it. When he does wow. it, no, when he does it, he does it good. He's like, look, I'm... Uh, that's amazing. That's, that's amazing. Just amazing. Can, you know what, Keith? Can I ask we, you a question here? Well, yes, I was, gonna, is, I was just going to say, no, I was just going to say, we could all get up and walk out and do a little dance. Let's walk out it, to a dance. We'll see you guys yeah. next week. And this okay. has been... <laughs> <laughs> this is true to you. And... Uh, <laughs> Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Um, oh, wait, oh, wait, uh, wait, wait. <laughs> so, so why, why, um, why a staff? Why he, why did he take twelve staffs, staffs, staffs? staffs? Well, I've always looked at the staff as I, a, the, uh, as a symbol of authority, symbol right? Of authority or leadership or what? Sure. I mean, maybe some other a symbol of authority. The Hebrew word for staff is mateh, 
And uh-huh. Mate also means a tribe. Mm-hmm. And the, re- the reason it means tribe is because the head of the tribe, his symbol of authority is the staff. And uh-huh. so when he says the, you know, the staff that I choose, essentially he's choosing a tribe. And, he's cho- and, mm-hmm. and he's, what I think he's saying here is he's reiterating his choice of the tribe of, of Levi. Um, and, mm-hmm. and within Levi, he's, you know, his, you know, cause we had this whole thing just now with Korach and, and they wanted to be the, they wanted to be Kohanim. And so the point is that, you know, I haven't rejected them. The, the ones who rebelled, they got swallowed up and the ones who brought the incense who shouldn't have, they got burned up, mm-hmm. but I still choose Levi. And within Levi, I still choose Aaron's line as the Kohanim. I think that's Amen. the message. There it is. Amen. And then Moses, uh, Moses brought out the rods from before Yehovah to all the children of Israel and they looked and each man took his rod, and Yehovah said to Moses, "Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony, uh, to be kept as a sign." Here it is, Keith, again, as a sign against the rebels, that you may put their complaints away from me, lest they die. And thus Moses did, <clears throat> just as Yehovah had commanded him, and so he did. Yes. So the children of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, "Surely we die, we perish, we all die. Whoever comes, whoever even comes near the tabernacle of Yehovah must die. We shall all utterly die." Shall we all actually die? It says. Well, what, what, one more thing, which, which, because um, we, we actually missed something in uh, back in uh, chapter six, uh, uh, chapter sixteen, verse twenty-four. Back. Yeah. That I just, I just remembered this. Um, could, could you read? Can you read that in your translation, uh, Keith? Number sixteen twenty-four. Yeah. Uh, it says here, uh, say to the assembly, move away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Ephraim. Mm-hmm. The tents. And what do you got there instead of tents? Yeah, I've got tents. I've got tents as well. Really? So the Hebrew word there, and, and I'm reminded because we, you know, at the end here it talks about, it says, uh, whoever comes close to the tabernacle of Yehovah shall die. That was in, at the end of chapter 17. Mm-hmm. And the word there for tabernacle is mishkan. Uh, and that's exactly the word that appears in uh, Numbers 16.24. Speak to the congregation saying, uh, uh, go up from around the Mishkan of Korach, Datan, and Aviram, the oh. tabernacle oh, of Korach, wow. Datan, and Aviram, and and they may have actually made for themselves a tabernacle. Oh, there it is. Say tents. They had, and, and so this is really the paradigm of the high place. You know, the high place is where God says, Yehovah says, only bring offerings. That's in Leviticus 17. Only bring offerings to the place, uh, to the entrance of the tent of meeting. Mm-hmm. Anywhere else, that's spilling blood. Mm-hmm. If you go bring in your streets or in your on your hilltops or wherever you want offerings and it's not to the tabernacle, you're a murderer. It's as if you spilled blood. Mm-hmm. And um, and so he so you know now where that tabernacle was, the tabernacle of Jehovah, it moved from time to time. Every time, you know, sometimes it was a day, sometimes it was a long time. We read about that. And then eventually the the place was chosen permanently. The place he chose the place his name forever mm-hmm. became Jerusalem in the time of David and Solomon. Um, and so already back here in the desert, they're building a rival tabernacle, the Mishkan of Korah. That's only a Torah there. pearl. That's all it is, is a pearl that you want to, you, you want to sandbag us on. Oh we go over the verse goodness. and you don't tell us that? That's huge. Nehemiah. I'm glad we came <laughs> back amazing. on that. because that, now, now, doesn't that illustrate, though, Keith, that illustrates yes. uh, uh, in verse, uh, let me see, verse 14, also in, uh-huh. in um, where, where, where they just they protest and they say, we will not come up. In no, verse uh, 12 and there. verse 40, we're not coming here. up. We've set up yeah. our own tabernacle here, and we're yeah. not acknowledging yours anymore. This is the gear right here. This is what we're okay. doing. Yeah, that's I right. want to give credit to K- King James Version, because there in the King James, I just looked it up. It says, speak into the congregation, saying, get you up from about the tabernacle of Korach. So there it is. it's right there in the there King James, and oh, it's certainly not there. there in the Hebrew, Mishkan. Amen. Amen. Boy, oh boy, that really does illustrate it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Goodness me. Big, big difference. <laughs> Huge difference. Yeah. Keith, will you take us through chapter 18? <laughs> well, we got I some important things. I, I don't think I can get past first two. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, come on, come on. We, we gotta, we, let's see if we can do this one in the nearly inspired Methodist Bible. Keith, take it from here, my friend. You're, you're driving the bus now. The Lord said unto Aaron, you and your sons and your father's family are to bear the responsibility for offenses against the sanctuary. Also, <laughs> you and your sons alone are to bear the responsibility for offenses against the priesthood. Bring your fellow <laughs> Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you and assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of meeting. <laughs> Come here. Did what you say that, that Jono is from England or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. This guy's amazing. I love his voice. <laughs> All right. Well, no, 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 no. So it awesome. is uh, br- yeah, Levites from your, yeah. So bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you and your assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the testimony. Hmm. Oh, I want to shout when I re- hear that. So we've, mm-hmm. we've got this. They will join you. And then again, 
uh, in verse 4, it also says, and they will join you. And, and when I read that, something pops for me, which is that this is a play on words with the name Levi, which is mm-hmm. is Levi. And when we first had read about this, this was Genesis 29, verse 34, when mm-hmm. Levi is born, the son of, uh, of Leah, says, yes. and she uh, conceived again, and she gave birth to a son, and she said, this time my husband mm-hmm. will join me. For I've uh, given him three sons. Mm. Therefore, she called his name Levi. And why she call his name Levi? Because join here in uh, Genesis twenty nine thirty four is the word Yilave. Yilave, mm. Levi. It's mm. a play on words. It's, it's a, uh, or a, uh, in this case, it's actually the, a name explanation. Here we have that name explanation turning into a word pun in uh, Numbers eighteen verse two, and then again verse four, where it says Yilavu. They will join and Vinilvu, and they will join. So mm-hmm. twice we have the same root as the name Levi. So you could translate this legitimately. You could say, um, uh, you could say, and also in verse two, you could say, and also uh, um, the your brother, the tribe of Levi, uh, the tribe of your father, bring him close, and they will Levite you, and they will serve you, because mm-hmm. Levite to Levite means to join. Now the reason mm-hmm. I get so excited about this verse is there's another passage that there's actually two more passages that use this exact same word pun, and and and, and it's in a prophetic sense. And that's the first one is uh, if, uh, if we could jump over to the book of Isaiah real quick. Isaiah chapter mm-hmm. four, verse one, it says, "For Jehovah shall have mercy upon Jacob, and he shall once again choose Israel, and he will place them upon their land, and the sojourner shall Levite upon them and be added upon the house of Jacob." So here it's talking about Israel in the end time being brought back to his land after being scattered to the four corners of the earth. And at that time, when Jehovah brings us back to the land, the sojourner, the ger, the one who joins the covenant, same mm-hmm. word as in Exodus uh, that we read over there in Exodus chapter 12, 43 to 49, the ger, he's going to join himself upon Israel and be added to the house of Jacob. Amen. So that, that's exciting Amen. to me. So, that, so they're going to be Levited. They're going to join the sojourners. And then again, mm-hmm. we have this in more detail in uh, Isaiah 56. And we probably brought this passage before. I'm going to really quickly... Because I know we're running out of time. Really quickly read through this. Uh, starting in verse 3, it says, Let not the son of the Gentile, who Levites himself to Yehovah, Hanilva, Hanilva el Yehovah. Same word, exact same word, as mm-hmm. appeared in, uh, in, uh, in Genesis, and again in Numbers, and then he, there in Isaiah 14. He will, the son of the Gentile, who Levites himself to Yehovah, to say, uh, he shall not say, Yehovah is surely separating me from his people. And, and that's a very powerful uh, word pun in Hebrew because we've got the contrast between join and separate. So he's joined himself to Yehovah, and Yehovah tells him, don't say Yehovah has separated you, uh, me from, from, your, from his people. In mm-hmm. other words, that's his natural inclination to say, I've joined Yehovah, but I'm really not part of his people. I've joined him, but I haven't joined his people. Yehovah says to him, don't say that. And then he goes back in verse 6, and he continues in Isaiah 56. And the sons of the Gentiles who joined themselves to Yehovah, to leave, who Levite themselves to Yehovah, Nilvim, same word, to serve him and to love the name of Yehovah, to be his servants, all those who keep the Sabbath uh, from desecrating it and grab hold of my covenant. I will bring them mm. to my holy mountain and make them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their, uh, their peace offerings shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Oh, that's exciting. Now, yes, amen. the fact that he's talking here about the burnt offerings, that, that feeds back into the, um, the word pun that's related to uh, to to Levite because the Levites were involved in bringing the burnt offerings. They were uh, the ones who assisted the sure. the um, the Kohanim, the priests. Mm-hmm. And here he's saying, "I'm going to accept the sacrifices even of these uh, Gentiles who join themselves to Yehovah, who Levite themselves to Yehovah." So that's exciting right. to me. Amen. Woo! Amen. Amen. There it is. John Keith, you're still driving the bus. Oh, I'm not driving this. <laughs> Well, oh, I, you know, I, I don't know. There so. might be other. No, no. There are there are there are other major major things here. It says uh, you're to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar, so the wrath will not fall on the Israelites again. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you, and that's an important one because mm. you know when he says uh, they're a gift, I mean that. I mean maybe it says something different, but I'm looking no, at there's, the NIV. There's an emphasis. No, there's an emphasis here. I've got it also in uh, in the uh, King James. It says. They are a gift to you, given by Yehovah. Further down, it also says, I gave, I, I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, when I read this again, I, I mean, there's this, there's sort of, there's a sobering issue of, uh, there's, these are the ones who have selected to come n- near to me. And yes, in fact, it probably is a tough pill to swallow when you're not selected. I'm, I'm not selected. Why am I not one? I'm just like you. I want to have my own Mishkan. I want to have my own censors. I want to have my own thing. 
But, you know, again, this focus ends up being what has Yehovah determined? What has he selected? Whom has he chosen? Who has he chosen? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, that's the issue. And then to say there's that. Here's the gift, but don't play around with the gift. Here's the gift. There's a real serious thing that comes with the gift. And if I haven't given you the gift, don't try to take the gift. <laughs> it's pretty mm. – that seems to be pretty serious. Well, I, I think I think I think for the Levites, the challenge was even greater because it's not just that they weren't selected. I mean, in a sense, they're, they're finalists. I mean, they they can smell it. They can literally smell it. They're so close, they can almost taste it, but they don't got it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not like the Cohen do, right? Well, the Cohen, well, and, and, and and that and that's the point that the Levites, you know, with Korach, is he's like, well, wait a minute, I was chosen, I was set apart. Why can't I be? Mm -hmm. Why can't I go and bring these sacrifices in the temple? I see him doing it. I'm the one who's slaughtering it. I'm the one who's skinning it, doing all the, the dirty work. Why can't I just bring the sacrifice? And, well, that's what Yehovah said. Mm. Amen. Amen. There it is. All right. Are we going we're gonna to jump along here because we're yeah, running out of time. Running I'm going to jump all the way. Unless there's something that you want to point out, I'm well, jumping we, we, to verse. We, to verse Go on, what? Well, no, yeah, we got we we? to do verse. Uh, we got to do the whole thing of the Bechor, of the firstborn. So remember, he said he took the Levites in place of the firstborn, but that doesn't mean that his connection to the first, you know, and that was essentially there were a certain number of Levites and a certain number of firstborn. Mm -hmm. And so he essentially used those Levites to redeem those firstborn. But the next other firstborns who come in the future also still need to be redeemed because they mm -hmm. became Yehovah's uh, on the day of the of the of the plague um, of the firstborn over in Egypt, the 10th plague. And so maybe you could read Keith uh, verses 15 through, I don't know, uh, I don't know, 16. 17. Okay, the first offspring of every womb, both man and animal, that is offered to Yehovah is yours. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver, mm -hmm. according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 gallons. It, it sounds familiar. There it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've, we've visited this before, but here it's being reiterated. You know, this, this covenant with the Levites, the choosing of the Levites, does not invalidate Yehovah's connection to the, uh, the firstborn. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, so then the uh, Yehovah said to Aaron, "You shall have no inheritance in the land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your Amen. inheritance Amen. among the children of Israel." Boy, how about that? Uh -huh. yeah. can, can we can we just say something real quick, or maybe talk a little, just thirty seconds on verse nineteen? We got this sure. covenant of salt; it is forever before Yehovah for you and your offspring with you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's an eternal covenant being made here. We, we, can, we, can we please read the verse about the eternal covenant? <laughs> well, well this, is what, this is what it says. I mean, this, this is the second time that I remember reading about the covenant of salt, too. Uh, all, the heave, all the heave offerings of the holy things, which the children of Israel offer to Yehovah, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before Yehovah with you and your descendants with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're right. We had we had read that already. That was Leviticus two thirteen that we read about the eternal mm -hmm. covenant of salt. But uh, you know, I think it's worth uh, it, it's being reiterated here. And how many eternal covenants do we have? We might as well uh, point them out and, and and you know look at them and mention them. Sure. Okay. Go on then. Well, no, that, that's it. That's I think it's okay. I think it speaks I think it speaks for itself. I'm in. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, I'm no, missing you know, something here though because no, honestly, the, the covenant of salt I don't get it. What what I don't. Well, so anyone... the, salt, the salt is the symbol of the covenant. Every sacrifice has salt that's brought with it. Has salt, sure. Oh, okay. Every every, every flower uh, sacrifice that is has you know every meat sacrifice has an uh, attached flower sacrifice, and and with the flower or with the, the grain offering, you then bring salt, and that that okay. salt is the symbol of this covenant. So and, everything you know, is accompanied with that, salt, and therefore I mean, it is the symbol. I, of the I covenant. mean, ima oh. imagine eating food without any salt. What that would taste like. Um, I mean, we, it's, I think it's hard for a lot of people in the Western world because everything mm -hmm. we, we buy in and, um, you know, that, that's processed food is so heavily laden with salt. You know, we're like, well, why would I add salt? Is, you know, it tastes great. Yeah, but sure. now make something from scratch. Make soup from scratch mm. and, t and taste it without any salt and you'll see the difference. There it it's, is. A, it's a profound difference. Sure. And, um, and I think that's why salt is something that the flavor really stands out. And that's why it's such a powerful symbol of this covenant. You can't miss the salt. Fair enough. Oh, Keith? No, I was going to just say, I think that it's, it's, it is, in looking at the sign, but what's really funny is when uh, Nehemiah said, so let's look at the, how many everlasting covenants, Jonah's like, okay. You got a list there, right? You got a list. <laughs> no, no, that, so, uh, so I didn't okay, say let's look point. at all of them. I said when we come to one that's an everlasting <laughs> covenant, we've let's got to slow down and, and, and focus <laughs> on it. <laughs> 
<laughs> you picked up on that, Keith. I'm glad you did. So, nice behold, job, I have yeah. given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear the sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever. Therefore, your, uh, throughout your generations, that the... Uh, that among the children of Israel, that they shall have no inheritance for the tithe of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to Jehovah, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they have no inheritance. So, so if we don't understand, so the priests have Jehovah, he is their portion, he is their inheritance. And, well, they, uh, they don't look, so most people, everyone back then, you know, 98% of the population and really up until 200 years ago were farmers. Mm-hmm. And so what he's saying is they're not going to get land to farm because they're in their portion, their piece of land is Yehovah. Amen. Now they do have six cities that they end up getting, but you know, that's places to live and, you know, maybe raise a few, you know, goats or something. Mm-hmm. You can't really live off a few goats as you probably know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, um, you know, so they, they uh, I mean, that's basically the idea that they're, they're going to get these um their service to Yehovah uh then then is the what will provide them food and mm-hmm. they're provided food you know when they bring a sacrifice whatever sacrifices are brought they get a piece and they get you know uh they get a te- um you know they get some of the there's a tithe that's given to the levites they get a tenth of the tithe the one mm-hmm. percent essentially of the of the total and they get all these different gifts and offerings and heave offerings and you know there's all these different things they get and then Yehovah spoke, spoke to Moses saying, speak thus to the Levite and say to them, when you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I have given from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heap offering of it to Yehovah, a tenth of the tenth, a tenth of the tithe, right? And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were a grain, the grain of the threshing floor is the fullness of the winepress. Thus you shall also offer a heave offering to Yehovah, all your tithes which you receive from uh, the children of Israel, and you shall give Yehovah, uh, give Yehovah a heap offering from it to Aaron the priest. Okay, so if I'm to, if, if I'm to understand this correctly, the tithe that, that the Levites receive, a tenth of that, is then uh, given to the Kohen, right? Is that, is that basically what it's saying? Exactly. They, they've got a kickback to the Kohen. Okay, so it's a, it's a tithe of the tithe. Okay, mm-hmm. so you may eat in this place, you and your household, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting, and this is the last verse. Of, reward. reward. It's their, it's it's their reward awesome. for the work in the tabernacle yes. of meeting, the last verse, and you shall bear no sin because of it when you have lifted up the best of it, but you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel lest you die. Amen. Wow. There you go. Okay. So we've been listening to the Torah Pearls on Truth To You, uh, where you can also freely download this and other Torah Pearls programs. Thank you, Nehemiah Gordon, Keith Johnson. My friends, appreciate you coming back on. Next week, we are... before you say no, before you say it, and if these programs have been a blessing to you, please go to Truth To You and see right there where you can donate. And and Jonah will do a great job for us, but he won't do a great job for himself. So I want to say for those (laughs) that have been listening, and if it has been a blessing... You know, help us out. Help, help Jonah. I'll continue to do this. He doesn't. He won't. He hates when I do this, ladies and gentlemen. But please uh, consider um, just going to uh, Truth to You, and, and uh, there's a, there's a little button there where you can make a quick little uh, uh, push of a button, and then that will uh, help support uh, this program. You can go to the donate page. It's the the little box at the end uh, of the room there, just next to the door. So next week we are in. Who <laughs> cut? Who cut? Numbers 19 verse 1 to 22 verse 1. And until then, dear listeners, be blessed and be set apart by the truth of our Father's word. Shalom. Shalom.